upcoming Total War titles, upcoming DLC, there are a bunch of leaks and rumors that are doing the rounds right now. Uh, Legend of Total War just dropped a few others uh, regarding the upcoming DLC, and he wanted to gauge the community reaction, which I think is actually a really great and in good faith way of uh, giving the devs some overall idea of what the community reaction will be, because that will ultimately translate into dollars that will then keep this project going and hopefully give us a finished game when all is said and done. But what does the finished game look like? Well, no one's really quite sure, and everyone's a little bit concerned that if the wheels fall off prematurely, we won't get that finished product. But this is something that I threw together probably about, I don't know, two, three weeks ago, except I made a couple of minor changes to make sure I fit in and include those rumored elements. And there's a slight reworking of some ideas, but I think this all comes together. And ultimately, if this is what they got in six DLCs, Plus, I've added one more because I'm selfish like that. This is what, at least for me, would be a complete experience. And this isn't definitive. You do not have to agree with this. Please actually disagree with it in the comments. Talk between you all why you do and why you don't want certain elements because the more clear and concise we are about our thoughts and expectations, the more we can hopefully communicate this to the devs. They make content we like and we don't have the opposite where they dump stuff we don't like, we don't buy it, and then this all comes to an end, which at the end of the day is is really what none of us want. Now just to set up of the format, I'm going on the basis that there is DLCs with three paid lords and one FLC and I was going to do a video on why CA should bring back FLC lords for every single release and I think it's so important. It is such a gesture of goodwill to go to the community. Hey, thanks for supporting the game so far. Please take this lord as a token of our appreciation and if you think it's worth it, feel free to buy some more lords. But more importantly, for the people that are maybe doing it a bit harder or just more casual fans, they have have something new to jump into, they can join in discussions, they can jump back into it again, and it's a great way to keep the fan base healthy and happy. Every DLC in this lineup will have an FLC Lord. But what do we want? Let's just jump straight into this to give you a quick overview. So what are the current issues of Immortal Empires? I'm just jumping into a op uh, open game here. Um, well, first of all, Ind and Koresh are still blocked off. Additionally, there is no Nippon, and I will address this with my six, actually seven DLCs uh, that will um, address all of this. Half the Cather and Dragons are missing. The Dark Elves are currently getting rolled in their home ground because there are not enough of them. The High Elves are two pinned in, and six of the eight base game factions from Warhammer 1 and Warhammer 2 aren't reworked yet, so we are going to rework all of these, introduce the new content in an order that doesn't destroy the game's balance, and it gets us to the end in time for the end times. Now first up, this horrible table will make sense in just a moment. Let me quickly explain what we have here. Across the top we have all of the factions in the game currently, running from Warhammer 1 to Warhammer 2 to Warhammer 3, and then the DLC specific races. This was originally done as a pricing matrix, so if you'd like to see the breakdown of the games and the DLC and what pairs to what race, there's a more clear version of this with the price tags to help you make an informed decision as a buyer. But this is is looking at what has been released and the total number of lords of every single faction. Now there are currently only 96 that are, have a playable faction but I've also included Porus Toddbringer, the Red Duke and South Oriel, all of which can be confederated but do not have a starting playable faction. At the time of writing, the Thrones of Decay is the latest following the infamous Shadows of Change DLC. And of course, Warhammer 3 has some catching up to do in order to get these based races up to the same count as their Warhammer 1 and 2 counterparts. So objective needs to be the base game races, the humans need at least five lords, the demons need at least three lords. So I'm working off the original roadmap, and that's not to say that this DLC has been shelved, but I'm gonna follow that roadmap and almost continue in the spirit of that, and you'll see why in just a moment. So currently, we have just gone of Thrones of Decay, and that addressed the Empire of Man and the Dwarfs, two of the Warhammer 1 races. So that was Warhammer 1 Part 1, as well as a Game 3 race. 
Following this pattern, the next DLC would be Slanesh as the demonic race, also gaining an FLC Lord, and then the High Elves and Dark Elves because they have so much lore and backstory. Starting off with my staple High Elves, there is no doubt in my mind that the legendary Lord would not be Sea Lord Aislin. He flies in a sky cut him out, and he is an excellent choice of Lord. And where would he start? Well, I would have him starting down here in the Eastern Colonies just to start off with. We have enough High Elves around Ulthuan. We don't really need any more action up here, he'd just get wasted as fodder. So let's start him here in the Eastern Colonies, and later on, when we expand this part of the map, we will locate him around this section here, so he can have a one-on-one -on -one with Lockyer Felhart, the Admiral and the Sea Lord facing off mono a mono. It sounds pretty epic to me. His legendary hero would be Caradron, the captain of the Phoenix Guard who flies upon a Frost Phoenix. He would give buffs to Phoenix units, so that Arcane Phoenix Doomstack will hit even harder. I can't wait. Non-legendary lords and heroes would be the Anointed of Assyrian and the Loth and Sea Helms bolstering Phoenix Guard and of course Loth and Sea Guard respectively. Of course the big centerpiece model will be the Sky Cutter. The High Elves are also known as the Sea Elves and this is a great opportunity to accentuate that part of their character. The only people that really crap on influence I've noticed are the people that don't really play High Elves. But that's not to say it could still be improved. The biggest thing I want is I want a trade lanes mechanic to have various ports linked up and each one counts as a multiplier. The resources you have and the resources you're trading should all be able to be stacked paired and influence buffs to your sea based units and your economy at large. You should depend on trade. I would love the additional layer of strategy to really fight to keep your allies alive. Not because you need them, but because you make money off them. It is so haughty and high elven to think, uh, we'll save these guys only because they'll break even in about uh, one or two years. In my mind, they're still probably the most powerful faction in the game, so they don't need a buff, but a few extra toys and a more lawful and more trade-centric economy would be very welcome in my eyes. Just a quick reminder, guys, if you are enjoying the video, please consider liking and subscribing. It really helps out. Ask any question in the comments, I answer everything. And if you'd like to talk strategy, feel free to join the Discord. Discord. Cheers. Next up, their arch rivals, the Dark Elves, and I think Mengel Manhide would be an excellent addition for them. He starts in Clark Karond, and this would give them a bit more board presence. Now that you'd have Marathi, Malekith, and Mengel, you would finally have a trifactor of Dark Elves able to unite and start pushing back the threats. The problem the Dark Elves have is they're kind of constrained, they can't quite unite as easily, and they can quite easily be bullied away from the water, and that's where they need to be strong. Giving Malekith some backup would really help anchor the race and ensure they can really thrive. For the centerpiece model, absolutely the Royal Hydra, a tier 5 Hydra, their signature beastie, hitting harder, more glorious it's going to be great. Their legendary hero would be Shadowblade, the chief canine assassin to Crone Hellebron, so she should get some benefit in unlocking him a bit earlier. A lot of people have slept on the Dark Elves, but their slave mechanic has been gradually improved a fair bit over recent times. They can fast track construction, and the degradation rates are far less than they were. Just a tiny bit of fine tuning, and I think we'll be in a good spot. I absolutely love the need to go out and raid to get more slaves to maintain the economy, and the sheer disregard regard for the purposes you use them for when you so need. So overall, I think the Dark Elves don't need much, but I would like to see a revamped loyalty system. Not that the current one's bad, but it could use a bit more guts, and I think it would be more based around power. The power, and that is what draws loyalty to you. By being powerful and domineering, that could help confederate, but also reduce the chances of betrayal. Conducting hero actions, assassinating their characters, forcing their enemies to break non-aggression pacts, using your power and bullying just like a Dark Elf would. A revamped loyalty power system would just add so much flavor to the campaign, and when it's Skaven's turn, they can steal it. The Slaneshi Lord would be Drakala, starting ideally somewhere around the Nagaron region. This would also give Nakari a lot more more scope to his campaign because once he's got this area secured, he then has a goal to go up, unite, and then trash the Dark Elves as well. There'd be so much replayability back and forth by having another Slaneshi Lord up here. Notice the way I've set this up, the Game 3 racers always get the FLC Lord to try and bolster their numbers up to get them on par with Games 1 and 2. So I'm thinking the Mask of Slaanesh, the favoured Demonette, I think she is a must, bolstering Demonette units to insane amounts. There's a lot of fun to be had there. Worst case, put her as a legendary hero because I want to see her. 
And that's our first DLC with the High Elves, Dark Elves and Slanesh basically completed. I know you can make an entire DLC dedicated to Slanesh, but I've got to work with the parameters of what I have, which is six at most seven DLCs. And this is the best way I think we can get there. To be honest, I don't think the High Elves or Dark Elves actually need more DLC, but this is what they're getting. DLC number two, and it is Korn's time to shine. There are a number of good choices for Korn, but I would think I'll go with Arbel for now. Depending what you want, it's multi-choice. And an FLC, of course, it's gotta be the Warhammer 3 race. So I'll pick Uziel Skulltaker, the greatest bloodletter, giving excellent buffs to those bloodletter units. I just love legendary lords or characters, which completely reshape the way you build an army. Having the legendary lords that encourage a certain style of play is what makes the battle element of these games so replayable. So Thrones of Decay dealt with the first First half of the Warhammer 1 races, now it's time to deal with Warhammer 1 Part 2, the Greenskins and the Vampire Counts. Oh boy, they've been waiting. So the Greenskins, Legendary Lord, it has to be Gorfang Rodgard. Alternatively, Borbad Ironclaw the Warboss and the Legendary Hero Borgut Beatface and he would give some amazing orc buffs for all of the players including myself that wish there were more ways to buff orcs having this guy in your army he'll be similar to Gorda's backstabber for the Chaos Dwarfs having that guy in your army makes these units which don't seem like much able to do amazing things and that's what I want to see it's almost this legendary hero is what I think the is basically the only thing the greenskins are missing now their rework was so good they play so good they beat each other into submission they beat everything into submission the campaign just plays the way it should the greenskins already have a very dynamic roster but a special destroyer would certainly bring a smile to my face as for a new greenskin faction i mean the obvious choices are in grand cathay where they can have a good old smash or down in lustria for a bit more kick and now the long-awaited vampire counts to all you vampire count mains i salute you you are the most patient patient crowd now i'm sure there's many out there that would have thought conrad von karstein would be the next legendary lord and no he should be a legendary hero and a damn good one his armor is amazing he will look amazing on the battlefield but as a legendary hero because the legendary lord in my mind neferata starting at the silver pinnacle a proper Lemain sisterhood would be amazing, completely different starting position, brand new enemies, and of course the end goal being able to link up with the Von Karsteins in the Empire. A new bloodline with Handmaidens, this would be such a saucy DLC in the way that this faction would really feel different to the other Vampire Count factions. Completely different start, different units, it's kind of more in the vein of the Warhammer 3 DLC we've seen so far and I just can't second it. She looks awesome. Neferata, that's my choice. I'm sure there's other great ones. Let us know in the comments. A Winged Nightmare could be a centerpiece model with some ghost coaches acting as flying chariots, giving some excellent tactical versatility to the vampire counts. The new units in the roster would certainly help them play better on the battlefield, but the raised dead mechanic is just honestly this cheesy thing and I know it's exceptionally powerful but I think it's really masking the fact and the lack of depth in other areas. All the pieces are there, the bloodline system is there, just a tiny bit more depth. As of late we've seen excellent creative chops from the development team and I have no doubt if they apply that to the vampire counts, their final form will be something epic to behold and it will be more than just spamming raised dead. Maybe introducing blood kisses or some other elements into the raised dead mechanic so it's not just a crap stack generator. And with Thrones of Decay and that second DLC, that is all of the Warhammer 1 races basically finished. In a perfect world, it would be nice to get another DLC or FLC unit for Bretonia, but uh, it's a tight list and I'm sorry Bretonia, I don't see you making the money back. The issue they have with Bretonia is unlike the Vampire Counts where you would need to buy Warhammer 1 and then buy the DLC, which is two sales, in Bretonia they gave this away for free. So if they sell an FLC Lord, they don't really have an opportunity to get a second sell. I know it's kind of scummy viewing it this way, but they're a company and this is the way they're going to form some of their decisions. That said, I'm still hoping and praying that sometime, maybe around Christmas, we'll get a present in the way of just a tune-up for Bretonia and one more FLC Lord. Hopefully, Bretonia is that FLC gift that just keeps on giving and is rounded out with just one more release.
Now for the next DLC, the Southeast Kingdoms DLC. You heard it, I'm doing something a bit unique and it's not the way that you would have expected it, but I think this is the best way to tick as many boxes as we can with as little resources and overproduction needed on CA's part. The Southeast Kingdoms would encompass three main factions and they'd all get a bit of cross-pollination and that would open up this part of the map so the Southeast Kingdoms DLC will be a massive one and essentially in exile up here in the mountains of heaven is the monkey king himself. Calm down I'm sure there's some people who are doing backflips right now because the word on the street has always been that this would be a Cathay based faction but hold your horses at least this is my understanding of the law please correct me if I'm wrong essentially the monkey king would was a manipulative usurper. Coming in when the Dragon Empress and Emperor basically disappeared the same time Chaos invaded. It was an absolute shit show. He power brokered with Eshin, allowed Zinch to take a hold, and fractured the entire kingdom of Cathay. Originally, there were eight dragon children who were very well acquainted with the storm, iron and jade dragons but the light dragon was last seen cruising up in the Norskan mountains basically assumed dead along with the spirit dragon who's basically buried underwater somewhere along the great dragon river this absolute disaster was subtly named the Time of Darkness and Disharmony, which is very calm wording on the Chronicler's part. From what I see, the Monkey King's essentially in a state of political limbo, unable to build a big enough power base to take on all of Cathay, being kept in check with the Fire Dragon, Li Dao, who governs down here. When he's introduced, the Burning Nomads faction will be replaced by him, as you see here. But the Monkey King's presence in these mountains has almost a geopolitical benefit for Cathay, in that it provides a buffer state to end and Koresh. This is why I would group the Monkey King in as a tri-factor with these two areas. All three would share units but not have the exact same units. The Monkey King would have access to some defecting Cathayan units. But no doubt he'll be able to get Tigerman mercenaries, units from Ind, and this would complete this part of the map. And also it allows a few starting positions to move a few people that are currently in Araby over here and you can maybe see where I'm going with that. Now to DLC number four, and now we really can see in full flight that I'm really trying to make everything work with only six DLCs, with four Lords per DLC. But we are now going to introduce Nippon, and not as a full-fledged faction. There's no way we're going to get enough resources from CA dedicated to a niche faction like this. I'm just being realistic, I don't see that happening. But we could see it as an extension to an already very popular faction in Grand Cathay. Now I know some people want a standalone Nippon faction, but this is honestly the only way I see us getting Nippon in any form, and that would be Yin Yin, the Sea Dragon, introduced alongside the final Warhammer 2 races, Lizardman and Skaven, each of them receiving a respective rework. And here we can replace Aslan up in this corner here, ready for a showdown with Lockheed Felhart. Yin Yin would have some exclusive Nippon units embedded into the Cathayan roster and this is the way we can have our cake and eat it too. The basic Cathayan peasant units would fit right at home here but you can have samurai lords leading them giving a new array of Malay buffs to these units. Bombardiers, Mages, to make this work of course we need to make a subplot which uh, directs Union to Nippon and for an, maybe an alliance of convenience but I think it's something that absolutely could work and would be very enjoyable. I want all the Dragon Lords and I want a bit of Nippon, this is the best way I could see to do it. For the FLC Lord, it's about time Kislev got some love, let's give them their final FLC Lord taking them to a total of five lords, which would tie them now with Grand Cathay, five apiece, and this new FLC lord for Kislev would be Stepan Rassen, the Kislev clan chief. Malay Beatstick with the ability to buff up Kossars, as well as Winged Hussars. Now DLC 5, Dogs of War plus a Norska rework. The Dogs of War have been heavily requested. I'd personally much rather in Koresh or Araby, but that's just myself and I totally respect there's a lot of Dogs of War fans out there. And honestly, I can kind of see why. They are oozing with personality and their characters are pretty cool too. With their mercenary origins, there's so many ways you could work them. The iconic mercenary Borgio leading them could start as a Horde-style faction. Leonardo da Miragliano. Uh, you vetted the Steam Tank. 
His faction would be much more engineer focused, and Lucrezla Belladonna, the beautiful spellcaster, would clearly have a more arcane spin on things. Ikaclaw is going to be sweating bullets, but it would add a lot of spice to the campaign. And of course, the long awaited Norska rework and the FLC Lord, Egil Stybjorn, the leader of the Scalene tribe, who has been plaguing us all since Warhammer 1. He is a resident worshipper of corn, wielding two axes, screaming blood for the blood god, skulls for the skull throne, seems to win people a lot, and he would be a very welcome addition. I can tell you this much, having a legendary lord in this part of Norska would really put a lot of heat in the Empire. Maybe even too much, but I've got a bit of help coming for the Empire in a later DLC, but geez, that is a lot of Northwood pressure to deal with. Or I would actually have another Norskan lord who's veered very much off course to this new theatre of war starting around here. Now this is one I stuck in because, you know, it's my list, I get to throw one in that I want. Yes, I want Araby. Warhammer meets Caliphate, yes, please give me more. The Wizard Callus Palace, no doubt a play on the House of Wisdom that was originally at Baghdad. With Kesa Bar now the starting ground for Manfred von Karstein, so that would be a key early target. And of course, Kesa Bar, occupied right now by Manfred von Karstein, would give a very compelling early quest for your expansion. Naturally, it is a bit crowded here, but with the map opening up, there would be plenty of places to go. Ogre Kingdoms, of course, getting Gorfag Rock out, and that would really help them out. They need a bit of a rework. There's just not something quite ticking over with them. It's been a bit since I've actually played them because they're a bit one and done at the moment, honestly. They have the potential to be one of the most unique factions, and they are with their camps, but I think the camps just need a few more mechanics, maybe another resource. All the parts are there, they just need reworking a bit. Now last and certainly not least, we have the freaking end times. And this could be DLC 6, but I hope it's number 7 and I hope they manage to jam in as much as I've said. This is very overly ambitious, but it is what but my goal here was to make what I think would be a great and complete game, and this is just what I would do. In addition to the factions we see here, there would also be a large narrative component that would be embedded into Immortal Empires, no doubt. This would influence the other Chaos Lords and Demons, and it looks like now the first two DLCs of Demons, i.e. the Slanesh and Corn content, will be jammed into this, and this will be a large piece DLC. So safe to say the narrative component will be quite sizable here and there might even be more characters but I'm keeping with the rules that I set myself in the beginning. Of course we need Nagash for the Tomb Kings as the centerpiece for this entire piece of DLC. There will be large narrative components that move in. As for the Realms of Chaos I do not want to see them again. A lot of people are saying yeah let's, let's integrate those into Mortal Empires that'll be fun. No! No, leave it in Realms of Chaos in a game where each turn is meant to involve building, diplomacy, fighting, defending, to then just be playing a single board game where you just move one piece per turn through a maze, it just does not work. It is the wrong game. The Realms would be fine if that was a standalone game. I love that they tried something, it just didn't work here. Hey, I don't mind quest battles being in there. Just hit me a teleporter, send me up there. It'll probably take a few patches to balance it because I think it's going to be ambitious, but by the end of it, I think it will be absolutely worth it. Joining the Gash, I think should be Gorth the Cruel, another sorcerer prophet of the Chaos Dwarfs. Zartan the Black is cool for being cruel, but he's not a sorcerer prophet, and this would complete the trifactor of Chaos Dwarf sorcerer prophets. Now, completing the groupings, I, we can't get all the elected counts, of course, but we can get one more. Let's get Marius Leetdorf, the mad horse lord. Literally advises with his horse, but is one hell of a rider and could give unmatched buffs to cavalry units as well as demigriffs. He would start in Avaland, and I know what you're thinking. You know, there's we're going to have Avaland, Nuln, as well as Reichland. They're probably a bit too pressed together. There's too much empire happening there. And to that, I say no. This is still a challenging campaign with a lot going on. And now we're talking about adding more Norskans, more vampires, more pressure from all directions. Having a solid trifactor for the empire here would still not be easy, but would certainly give a lot of reward. It would technically make Karl Franz even more powerful because he can confederate more legendary lords faster. And let's face it, we all love a powerful Karl Franz. 
An end time DLC means the forces of darkness are going to be that much more powerful, so let's not move him away, let's keep him where he should be, and we can then summon the elect accounts just like we should be able to. And that's it for this video. If you did like my ideas, please let me know. If you hated them, say that as well, and just, just give your alternatives. The idea is to throw ideas out into the open so we can just have a marketplace of ideas, and as a community, just let's really work out what we do and don't want. Ultimately, if CA release DLC, which either pisses people off or just doesn't sell, then they're going to forecast less DLC, as fortunately, Thrones of Decay absolutely saved this franchise, but we need success after success at this point. As soon as the sales for a subsequent DLC fall below a certain threshold, their forecast for the next couple of quarters and then next year will be to taper off the crew and move them to other places. Your product clearly has a fan base of devoted people that are willing to back your product as long as it's what they want. As a community, let's put our thoughts together and tell them what that is. This is Ellen Plot Armor. I'll catch you next time.